that placid looking water at this moment is about to erupt. Actually, at this moment, the tide is flowing, ebbing, I should say. It's ebbing north at approximately 10 knots, and it is two feet above mean low water. The Narrows was like a monster. It, it, it captured people. It was like a live thing, almost. You know? So, and a lot of people had drowned up there. I mean, the, the painters had guides, you know, go the, the Baldwin, uh, one of them went up with a couple of couple of people up there, and never came back, and nobody ever found them, and that sort of thing. So it was much in our minds that we didn't we didn't go near it when we weren't, you know, with with our the sort of boats that we were running over to Quadra with and back and forth. We sort of anything north of Duncan Bay was a little yeah. ominous. In the Narrows in those days, before the Ripple Rock was blasted off, uh, it was just absolutely white out there, big waves and. And the whirlpools all the way back down to Browns Bay, I think, still is for that matter. It's wild. And you didn't fool around in it. And if the tide wasn't right, you just didn't go. Or if you did, you got into serious trouble. It was not a nice place. It was a very treacherous piece of water. It still has to be respected, but not to the degree it did before they uh, blew her up. Seymour Narrows is a place that you respect. If it scares you, don't go near it. You respect it. It's beautiful and it's a wild beauty. Vancouver to Alaska. Nearly a thousand miles of protected water. First navigated by Captain George Vancouver, this, one of the great sheltered waterways of the world, contains one formidable hazard. A hundred miles north of Vancouver, the cramped bottleneck of Seymour Narrows, just 800 yards wide. And at the southern end, mid-channel, the twin peaks of Ripple Rock. Daily, the tides of the Pacific coast grind their way through this narrow gorge at speeds up to 14 knots. Flooding south, then ebbing north again. A mass of conflicting waters boils over the rock into back eddies and 40-foot whirlpools that can spin a freighter like a pinwheel. Your tide runs through Seymour Narrows. There's boils there. Some of the whirlpools were sometimes as big as this room. But it's swirling. So you get a ship coming in there, especially a, a, a good-sized ship or something. And in those days, very low horsepower. They were usually steam and the tide would catch them and swing them over and there was the fang and she just ripped the belly right out of them. For a hundred years the rock has been taking its toll. 1875 the USS Wachusett and the Saranac, 13 gun men of war. The HMS Satellite, 1884. The Danube stranded in 1904. And in 1911 the SS Spokane, a total loss. More than 20 major vessels have come to grief here, and some 114 people have lost their lives. I was acquainted with Ripple Rock uh, shortly after our arrival here, and uh, realized that it was, you know, what a navigational hazard it was, and all the many lives that had uh, had taken in over the years in various means of uh, trying to destruct it, to, to explode it from the top end. In fact, um, a family in Campbell River that <clears throat> I was well acquainted with, uh, uh, she lost her husband, and of course the children lost a father, and, uh, and I think it was, maybe it was the last attempt to do it in that fashion, I'm not sure, but uh, uh, yeah, you know, reading the history of it, how they were trying to anchor barges out there, and I think they even tried to run guy lines from the barges on to Maud Island and the other side of the channel too and, and work that way but you know the water flows through there so rapidly and everything and it's just a real dangerous spot. Well, there was an earlier attempt to uh, to remove the, the peaks of the Ripple Rock too and that uh, <coughs> that uh, they, they got a barge I think you have the videos of it here but they got a, a barge and they anchored it with cables from both sides of the of the narrows, 
but it was, I guess they, they could never, a drill has to be pretty steady in order to the, the, the stand of it, otherwise I guess it would break the bits off and all, so th that failed. In fact, I'm not sure, I think, it, it, I think they lost a few men off of that. It, uh, it kind of capsized a bit or something one time. I worked for uh, Pacific Coral Navigation. I got a job there as a second engineer on a tugboat, and I was 14 years old. I worked for them, and uh, about a year later, I guess it was somewhere in 42, um, we went down to the States, and we brought this big barge up from uh, Columbia River, and we were going to take it up to Campbell River, and they were going to drill Ripple Rock. Uh, so we brought this big barge up, and in the meantime, they oh, they poured great big concrete blocks on four big scows, and they were going to use these to anchor the drill barge right over Ripple Rock, because they were going to drill it, and then they were going to blast it. But um, after we got up there, uh, got this drill barge all set up and a big crew of men on this barge, uh, all the tugboats hold, one, one tugboat holding the drill barge over the rock and four other tugs holding these big scows out with these concrete blocks on them and big, I don't know, piles of cable on it. So the time came we dumped all these concrete blocks off of for each corner of the barge and uh, that was fine. Everyone, you know, all the tugboats blew their whistles and everything, tightened up the lines on it and we took all the empties and ran in behind Maud Island where, it was, uh, where we anchored them all. And by the time we got around there, this drill barge and the whole crew were drifting through the narrows. Uh, all these cables broke, so it just didn't last hardly at all. So that was the first attempt at it. Now. I, I understand I didn't get to stay there, but I, I, we tended this drill barge up there for about a month, and they sent these all these scows back to Vancouver to, um, they were going to pour four more concrete blocks on them, but this time they were going to use anchor chain or a big chain to uh, anchor it instead of cable. They thought it would do better. So we, we stayed with this drill barge for some time, and they poured these blocks and shipped them up again. We tried the thing the second time out there, and the chains didn't last any longer than the first ones, the cable, so it was pretty unsuccessful. Yes, in 1942, the federal government decided to drill and blast the rock from the top in an effort to reduce it by at least 20 feet. The drilling barge, specially designed, and its concrete anchors, weighing several tons. ferried out and tipped into place. The barge was made fast. But at peak tides, current vibrations snapped the anchor cables like threads. The project failed. Well, this is your, well, we, like these, these blocks were 20 feet long and I guess about 12 feet in diameter. So they were big concrete blocks and thousands of feet of cable on them. The cable was, I think, inch and a half cable they had on it. And, uh, as we let each, each barge dump these concrete blocks in. And yes, we all expected it was just going to stay there. Nobody ever thought for a minute that the current was that bad. And uh, so, but they didn't, it just, tore, it just tore the cables to shreds. That's all there was to it. They got another gentleman. I used to know him. I used to fish alongside him when he'd come up there once in a while. But he, he, he didn't do like I did. I, he would always pick them up on the on the south side of my island, and I always when the, when the big heavy floods in the springtime, which was a running 15 knots, and he, it's one trip that he made. He was making the trip from my island to go across. He missed the point at Race Point. It was running so hard, so he came back up and uh, came up, and I think he must have gone right up to the Mott Island Light. And they, of course, the back 80 and the tides were running about and flipped them over. And that's when they, they had a crew, I think they just had about the same crew, about 13, 14 men up. And it rolled over them, and that's when they lost 11 men there. The miners we had were the best in North America, hard rock miners. And hard rock mine is a little bit different than... Uh, Mining for ore, eh? 
I mean, you could go through a seam of gold and not even know it. You just blast it and muck it out. Yeah, a lot of people have asked me about, uh, well, you know, you say 570 feet down, it's not that far. But you compare it to the, I always tell them, compare it to the stack at the mill. That stack is 350 feet high. I said, put another 220 feet on top of that. That's the, the height, the, the depth of the shaft. And the raises, well, that stack is 350 feet. And the raises duck 50 feet off, and that's how high the raises are. And the tunnel was 2,500 feet. It, it was quite exciting because it was to be the largest industrial explosion ever, I think, at least in Canada. And I think it was uh, something called nitrone was the, the type of explosive. It was a fairly new uh, mix. And uh, <clears throat> so there was, there was a, quite a bit of interest in it, for sure. And it, and it apparently did a far better job than what the contract called, too. They took the, the peaks down. There was two peaks there, and they took them both down to well below what the contract called for. The loading part of it was, I think they hired quite a few local guys to, to load it, this uh, Nitra Max, they called it. It was a new explosive. New to us, anyway. Yeah, they brought that barge load in there. I guess there were 70,000 cans of that stuff put in there. Probably 12 and a half ton or something. I think they started out, they wanted to put 500 ton of, uh, to blast it, and then they went to 750. And at the end, I think they went to 1,250. They figured, well, <laughs> you know, you had enough there to blow up the island, but they had to make sure they got it. They had uh, carts, we'd load them into the carts and hoist them up to the top, and then they had air uh, winches that would anchored at the end of these coyote holes, and they'd pull that cart up there and unload it, pile it up like cordwood. You look down the coyote hole and put that far from the roof, it was just all these cans piled up each coyote oil, eh? right out to where the raise was, raises were. I can't really remember. I think that our wage, uh, my wages were around 215 plus 10% danger pay or something. Saturdays and Sundays were double time. But, uh, it was good money. First check I got, in a, I, when I quit there, I went to work in the mill. The first paycheck I got, I damn near quit. You know, I look, what the hell is that, you know? <laughs> but I stuck it out because I, I got married and <laughs> had to have a job, so. Roderick Haig Brown, noted author and conservationist, is a magistrate in the town of Campbell River, 10 miles from Ripple Rock. The Ripple Rock project is of little local interest, except for the possible destructive effect of the blast. Presumably the main purpose is defense to enable the uh, convoys to get safely and easily through the inside passage. Larger vessels will be helped somewhat. I only hope that uh, helping them isn't going to make too much trouble for us. The authorities seem to have been rather casual about this possibility. The year before the blast, uh, my wife and I were living down at uh, Shelter Bay and we were all already hearing, of course, a lot about uh, the tunneling and the amount of explosives and so on going into this thing. And uh, we were also hearing rumors about the sort of big wind wave that was going to hit us at the time of the blast. And it was also about that time that uh, we got rid of the motel we had, and uh, uh, we bought a house on the river where I still live, and we moved into it in January of 1958. And 
so we were there, especially during this very short period before the time of the blast, we began to hear even more about the sort of dangers to Campbell River. What was going to happen? You know, when this blast took place, uh, it could blow out your windows. It could blow the glassware off your shelves and so on. And so we were advised that the thing to do on the, at the time of the blast, you know, was to open up all your doors, all your windows, put all your glassware on the floor. Well, I remember <clears throat> people in the community talking about it, but uh, it, uh, you know, it, it had a very low level at one time, and then, of course, that level kept increasing and increasing and as we approached the date that it was to be uh, touched off, and, uh, and that was a real, real big moment uh, in the community. A lot of uh, uh, suspense, a lot of people didn't know what to expect. Uh, people were talking about tidal waves, uh, maybe coming down uh, from Seymour and Arrows, maybe 15, 20 feet high, and swamping out the downtown core and this sort of thing. And, you know, breaking all the china in your house and various things like that. And, uh, of course, some people had already been through the earthquake in 1946, which caused a little bit of damage around here. But so um, it was the, you know, uncertainty of it all. No, just rumors that a lot of people had left. They were quite concerned. That I think, that, didn't they evacuate Campbellton? I'm not really sure. I heard that they had because if anything happened to the power dams, it, they would have wiped out Campbellton, like Elk Falls Dam and that. That's, that's the story I got, yeah. We knew there was going to be a blast, you know, and we knew that the, we, we knew that the RCMP was going to telling everybody that you're going to tape your windows and make sure, because this is going to be a horrendous blast. It was the world's largest non-nuclear blast, so actually everybody would be very apprehensive about that. But I don't think my dad taped the windows at all. Like tourist towns everywhere, Campbell River is usually quiet in the off season. But this time, it's different. As the big day approaches, you can't get a room at any price. A crowd of newsmen, cameramen, commentators, and hopeful sightseers. More than a hundred police officers in cars and launches have converged on the town to seal off the blast area and keep the channel clear of shipping. Well, we were awfully busy. A friend and I, Bob Lewis, we uh, had arranged for Watson and Ash, who had 12 transport buses, to come to Campbell River and transport people from the top of General Hill, up by the dam, to a site we had selected with a wonderful view of Seymour Narrows. And we sold tickets, I think it were $2.50 or $3, to board these buses and we'd take them in, this road to the area, so that they would be there for the explosion. And I can remember the night before, we were, Bob and I were partners in the Beehive at that particular time, I can remember the night before, selling tickets on these fool buses until about 10.30, quarter to 11 at night. People were coming in to stay at the Willows Hotel, and all the motels and everything were just jam-packed in Campbell River. And <clears throat> I can remember selling a ticket, ticket to Ray Williston, who was the, well, he was the Minister of Education at one time, the Social Credit Government, uh, late at night after he'd arrived here. And uh, it was just uh, a gung-ho day at... Uh, and we took, uh, I don't know how many hundreds of people up there. We had a spot that was fairly close to it on a bluff up there. Oh, I don't, it wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a mile away. But then uh, we had, to, he, I think it was him that picked out, or his government officials picked out another spot for us. And they even put a bulldozer in there to bulldoze this old road that went into that part of the country up above uh, Race Point there. and. Uh, and they had a nice clear, we had a clear view of it. It was a beautiful place, yeah. So, as the pictures will, uh, will uh, say. But speaking of this inspector, he, he told nobody to go above Courtney. You, the roads will be closed. Well, 
that didn't go over with, uh, with us at all. And uh, we told everybody that they were welcome to come right clean through because we were in business, or hopefully. So, uh, but uh, it didn't stop that much, so. I can remember the big build up to the day. You know, it was on the radio. It was this big, biggest non-nuclear blast ever happened. So we were all excited. Our town was tiny. I think there was only about 3,000 people then. And we listened to all these reports on the paper, in the papers and on the radios, and so we were pretty excited. But um, they were predicting there might be a tidal wave, and that's what scared us because we were right near the ocean. And my dad didn't seem worried, and he listened on the radio to it. And you know, the day came closer, and it got there, and I thought we'd be kind of evacuated, right, up the hill to where the um, high school was at that point on top of 7th Avenue and Dogwood there. But no, no, we went out on our yard looking over the water with our radio and I remember mom put all her dishes away in case the earthquake, you know, her good dishes that were in her buffet, in case the earthquake broke anything. And we went and stood out, my brother Ken and I and my parents on the lawn there looking over the ocean, over the Strait of Georgia there with the radio and listening to the countdown and I was so frightened but so excited also, right? I mean, this was a big thing at my age and, and I'm going, why, why doesn't Dad take us up the hill so we're safe? I mean, a tidal wave is huge. So I had this vision of us all being washed out to sea and nothing left of our home if I did survive and who knows where everybody would be. The warning rocket, a matter of minutes now, and the minutes fly. It's anybody's guess what will happen. Outside of atomic jobs, this blast is the biggest of its kind to date. There's enough powder in that rock to lift the Empire State Building a mile in the air. My mother told me the story that uh, my grandmother sent us her, she said, you know, Phyllis, when that explosion comes, Open your mouth and just equalize everything. I thought that was really kind of pretty kind of neat to do. I think the thing that I remember because I was so young is I was so excited because the Channel 5 and Channel 7, KVOS TV, were going to be in Campbell River and were actually uh, televising the big event. Um, a number of, of the people in Campbell River, of course, were quite worried because it was supposedly the or, the largest man-made explosion at the time. And I remember our neighbors across the street were from Germany and they carefully took all their china down, packed it away and were quite concerned. They said open your windows so there's no concussion and if you have a goldfish bowl put it in the bathtub in case it breaks and all these kind of things. So it was pretty, uh, pretty scary at the time. And then Bill will count down, uh, starting at 30 seconds, he'll give you down 30, 25, and count it down, uh, stopping when there are five seconds remaining until the time from the blast. Then we will open our mouths, which is the approved thing to do, we have been told. Uh, we're not plugging our ears, because even those in the firing bunker, only 2,500 feet from the scene of action, uh, have decided they don't have to plug their ears, but we have our helmets on, we will have our mouths open, our eyes wide open, and we'll just stand here and watch like you're going to do. It was special for me for one reason, because i was always been interested in television, and it was the first live location coverage that the CBC had ever done, if I'm not mistaken, from this little place called Campbell River, from this, well, outside Campbell River, way up in the sticks. So it was a big deal, and I remember they, they were in the bunkers there, and the the camera people with their big old-fashioned cameras and they had an announcer with an old-fashioned microphone who, who counted down, you know, 10, 9, 8. Luckily, these people came over and they had their radio and we heard the countdown. So we got, we did, we were able to see it. And, and it was spectacular. It, it was, it was really something. I mean, the whole, yeah, just like the pictures we all see of it from, that were taken from the, where the highway lookout is now. But the, uh, from there, it was still it was still an enormous thing, and of course we all waited for the noise and didn't hear a thing. There was just nothing. We were kind of somebody 
one of the people from Gulland Harbor had figured out how far it was and how many seconds it should be before the, the big boom. A couple of them even had cotton in their ears, and they were most, most disappointed when they, the cotton wasn't required. But uh, that, was, that was a bit of a letdown that we didn't hear it, because it, it, was, it was visually, it was certainly a, a big thing. But, and, then, and then we all waited for the tidal wave, of course, and that we'd figured out would probably take 15 minutes or something to get to us. And again, there was just absolutely no, nothing that we could see on, on the beach at all. The actual uh, explosion itself, I was able to watch from the living room of the Tolan family home. So their close friends were all gathered into the parlor where we had a uh, fairly new TV at the time, black and white of course. And uh, I remember looking out the windows and all the volunteer fire department were gathered around and were looking into the windows so they could also see the explosion on television. And I, uh, I guess I have to say that it was very anticlimactic. Uh, there was a, you know, we saw on the television the big explosion and the water went up and the water went down and, and that was it. On the day of, uh, of the blast, we did all that in the morning. But we also had bought a, a package that was uh, rather, rather seemed like an awfully good way to see the explosion when it took place. And that was, with, uh, that was at April Point. Now there was no ferry to it, but there was a water taxi and it was being operated by Phil Peterson. And the Petersons, of course, uh, had the uh, April Point uh, Resort at that time. So what they were offering was a trip over on the, fair, on the uh, taxi, breakfast, and a trip back after the blast. But everything was timed so that there, was, there would be plenty of time after, after eating breakfast to go out at the point, look up at uh, Seymour and Arrows and see the whole works. So out to the point we go, and we're all standing there. This was a blue bird day. Beautiful, sunny day, blue sky. He couldn't have asked for better, better seats, you know, other than the bunker. He couldn't have asked for better seats to watch all this. So, so we're standing there and talking and so on. We're, one of the fellows in, a, in the group had a portable radio, and he was listening to the broadcast from the bunker. So we were hearing what they were saying, which was mostly uh, all the stuff that preceded the blast and that, what they've been doing for years. And uh, this, so this was going on and so on. I would say probably about three or four minutes before the explosion on this beautiful day, there appeared just off Copper Bluffs a very dark cloud. It's like the curtain came down on the last act. And, you know, we were amazed. Where did it come from? You know, how did that ever get here? And why is it here right now? You know, that. But this guy has this radio going, so we're hearing that, you know, everything's going all right up there at uh, Seymour and Arrows. And uh, <clears throat> we, we're listening to the broadcast, which t goes into the countdown. You know, 10, 9, 8, 3, 2, 1. And there it goes, we're told. We never saw a thing, never heard a thing, never felt a thing. And probably in not more than five minutes after the explosion, that cloud disappeared. You know, how do you explain anything like that? Why I laughed was because of the opening of the salmon season on the west coast. And I thought, well, it was a good time to go up and watch the, the blast at the same time. 
So I took my family with me and uh, David, Anna, and Robin, and my wife, Flo. And we went up through the Narrows <clears throat> two hours before closing time, like shutoff time. And we waited on the upper end off Canish Bay for the explosion. There's a police boat there. Well, they had a police boat on either side to stop all traffic at the time. And uh, we waited there, and the wife was kind of worried about it, and uh, she put life belts on everybody. And uh, we just uh, waited for the countdown, and all of a sudden we heard a big bump, was all we heard, and there was rock and water flying everywhere. The sky was loaded, and uh, it dumped rock on either side, Maud Island and also Vancouver Island side, I guess. Yeah, that was a, quite a feat, all right. Quite an explosion. One of the largest, I guess, in the world at that time, so I understand. Countdown will start with Bill in just about 10 seconds, and from one minute uh, until minus, minus five seconds, Bill will give you the countdown to blast time. One minute to blast time. So anyway, the car countdown started on the radio and got down to the final minute there, and then the blast went. And we waited and we looked towards the narrows, waiting for this big wave, and nothing happened. <laughs> and nothing, and nothing. And finally we knew that was it. And it was such a letdown to the big buildup, right? As my brother said, it was anticlimactic. <laughs> it was, you know, you're just waiting and, and you won't, don't want it to happen, but you do kind of, just for the excitement of it. So yeah, and that was my memories. And I phoned my brother and talked to him and his memories were exactly the same as mine. So I thought, oh, I did remember right for 50 years ago. It's a long time to remember, clearly. The day, the day I was on, on a, a, a frigate called the St. Therese, there was four frigates and we were on cruising. In those days, the Navy cruised all over the world. I just decommissioned a, a big, great big cruiser called the Ontario and we still had sea time, so we commissioned the frigates, anti-submarine vessels, and we had gone down and done Australia, New Zealand, American Samoa, and we were off the coast of Fiji. And I can't think of the captain's name. All of a sudden it came over uh, the loudspeaker to any of, uh, any of you BC boys that know Ripple Rock, they just blew the hell out of it. We all kind of sat there. I was at boarding on 12th Avenue in Vancouver near the University Gates at a house, a home in the, that area. And my landlady had a television. And as far as I can remember is that we listened because we knew it was going to happen that day and we were watching. And then when the blast took place on the TV, I ran outside because we were told it was going to be the biggest man-made explosion and we'd all hear it. And of course, we ran out into the yard, into her garden, and there was no sound at all. It was just as though one of our kids had jumped from a, from a chair onto the floor. Just a little vibration. That was that was all there was to it. And went down to the beach to see if, uh, and we stayed down there. But there was nothing came that way either. There was no tidal wave, not even a ripple. I guess you know. And I guess my dad said that he'd taken people up to Steep Island, which is the next island up. Took a guy from life and a guy from time, either time or what, and they were going to film the big tidal wave that's going to come after the explosion. So they climbed a tree, and tied themselves to the tree. Of course, the explosion came. <laughs> Nothing happened. <laughs> security arrangement that has been in force here. Since five o'clock this morning, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police have put a cordon right around the danger area, which for land has been set at three and a half miles radius of Ripple Rock. The people who have come up in their yachts to have a look, unfortunately, have been uh, moved away because they are four and a half miles away from the area. And in the air, the airplanes have been warned off by the Department of Transport five miles on either side of the rock. But, you know, the funny thing was, I don't remember even hearing it on the radio, just being told it took place. Now, I don't know. 
I'm sure there must have been a, a huge noise, but it wasn't picked up by the uh, person doing the broadcast from the bunkers, that noise anyway. I don't know, maybe they had plexiglass or something, you know, to pr protect them from flying rocks. <laughs> It's hard to say. I, I don't know. As far as the blast, it was a terrific blast. There's one thing about the blast that uh, I don't know if they ever figured out what caused it or not. But if you ever watch that picture, you see a second blast there. The main blast will go up, and then to the left-hand side, there will be a shot comes out. Another shot. Now, there's a, there was two blasts, and you can see it. When you watch for it, you can see it plain as a day. But uh, there was a lot of wondering what happened there. But I watched the explosion on a little TV set that Bob Harrison had in there, and you could just see the, the water rise a little bit, maybe three or four feet, you know, and that was all there was to it except for the plume of smoke and what have we that went up. It was quite a day, one I shall never forget. So we had to get home and get all the glassware back on the shelves and close the house down and, and so on. And that's the way it happened for me. Yeah. Crazy, huh? Well, after they blew it off, of course, the turbulence was way less. I mean, you know, it was a hell of a lot easier to go through. You could go right over top of the rock if you wanted. But I mean, it was still there, a certain amount of it, but uh, it knocked off. I'll bet you 75% of the turbulence. Yeah. Yeah, that was a great thing to do. It was, it was a really a hazard, navigational hazard, that's for sure. Well, I, I think everyone uh, appreciated the fact that shipping was safer and that uh, you could, you know, go back and forth through there without the uh, concern that had been uh, so rampant in previous times. It, that my dad worked for uh, Bodell Stewart and Welsh in, in Enzies Bay and uh, they were always hauling logs and things in and out of there and it, it was a very dangerous place. So it was uh, quite a relief to all the families who had men who had to go through that area to know that it was now a much safer transition for them. 45 seconds to go. The, I, I don't know about you, Ted, but I'm really tensed right now. There is exactly 35 seconds to go. Thirty seconds. Twenty-five. With twenty. Nineteen. Eighteen. Seventeen. Sixteen. Fifteen. Fourteen. Thirteen. Twelve. 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, fire. And that was the end of Ripple Rock. Rain. The rock is gone. Impressive always but never so awesome as at the last. Finish in a mushroom 800 feet high, a mass of rock and water twice the weight of the tallest building in the world. But the jinx of the West Coast went without casualties, not an eardrum, not even a window. Safe 
passage through Seymour narrows at last. There's still the tide, but you can bucket now with over 40 feet of water clear beneath your keel. The rock will be remembered, but it won't be missed.